Welcome everyone to the Family Centered Care session. Um, we have three fabulous presenters. So in the interest of time, we're gonna jump right in. Our first presenter is from the Los Angeles Centers for Alcohol and Drug Abuse. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Jasmine Davalos, who is the Prevention Program Director. Hello, yes, thank you for having us and welcome, thank you. Yes, La Familia es Todo, and today I'm here to present to you a little bit and share with all of you guys a little bit of the work that we're doing here at LA Cotta, Los Angeles Centers for Alcohol and Drug Abuse. Again, my name is Jasmine and I'm the Director for Prevention Services. And here with me, I also have my colleague, Tom, which you guys will hear more about him shortly. To go to the next slide. And we can skip this one. I know you guys have our bio and presentations already put together, so we can go right over to the next one. Um, my portion is just to share a little bit about who is LA Cotta and the services that we offer to our community, our community partners, our youth, our young adults, as well as our parents. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We've been serving the community since 1971. This year, we celebrate our 50 year anniversary. And, you know, um, because of COVID, we didn't get to do a massive celebration like we hope to do. Um, and so we just kind of celebrated in our own and just developed the a 50th anniversary icon and just really disseminated through our social media platforms and did the best we could with the circumstances. We are an integrated behavioral health care service site throughout LA County. Um, we are in the city of Santa Fe Springs, California. Um, we are accredited by CARVE. Uh, facilitators are licensed and certified by the California Healthcare Services, um, DHC. We have uh, different priorities of level of cares. We're primarily focused on the substance use and, the, and mental health. So we treat the core core disorders. Um, we have 199 residential treatment beds, 211 recovery bridge housing beds and 500 plus outpatient and intensive outpatient treatment slots. We have about 14, well, we're at 17 locations across LA County that offer both intensive outpatient, outpatient, residential, and recovery bridge housing services to our community. Um, we are a community-based, school-based, and jail-based program. So we are, we are, we do provide, um, services at our, some of our local incarcerations, our jail systems as well, um, in both men and women um, prison systems. Uh, we emphasize on outcome-driven services. A lot of our, our services are driven and database. Um, so we have different um, evaluation teams that evaluate and, and, and show us our outcomes. Of, and we'll talk a little bit more evaluation and data as we get into the presentation. Um, we serve about 9,000 adults and youth and children annually. It's, our census is showing we're about 9,000 annually. Um, over 85% of our clients are people of color. So we primarily serve those minorities and people of color. 61% being Latino, 17 being black, 14% um, being white, 1% Asian, 1% American Indian, and 6% reported being mixed race. Uh, next slide, please. Um, LA Cotta saves lives, um, unite families and protects the community by providing access to nonprofit evidence-based behavioral health services that address the needs of the underserved and disadvantaged populations. We really try to focus on a full continuum uh, care and we meet our patients where they're at. I've heard many of our community partners really emphasize on meeting our, our patients, our participants, our clients where they're at. And that's really our modality. It's self-centered, client-centered um, and meeting the patient where we're at, offering them different types of services from intensive SUD treatment services to mental health, to prevention supportive services, to a comprehensive case management approach modality. Um, we also have an HIV department here as well. So we make it a point to address the HIV, the high risk, the STIs, and offer free HIV um, testing within our organization as well. Next slide. Um, just some more facts and just stats on really why LA Cotta has uh, focused on our victims of crime. 
Um, LA County has the largest child protective services agency in the nation. So we know that there is a lot of children um, who are victims of crime. Just, just to share down the street from where we're at, we have one of the largest um, DCFS locations or branches that I should say. And a lot of our network and outreach is coming from this location. Um, more than 35,000 open cases at any time across 88 cities in LA County. 59% of all open cases overseen by LA County Department of Children and Family Services involve substance use. So that's a, a really high number. 59% of the cases um, involve SUD in some form. Um, out of those, 21, 20, almost close to 22,000 California opioid overdose deaths. In 2017, we had an opioid crisis. 22% were in LA County and the highest rate by far in the California County. Um, opioid overdose is the leading cause of death um, for people released from the LA County jail system, which we know America's largest jail system is the second leading cause of death for 59 homeless people who are here. Um, here within our neighborhood cities and different school districts, we have seen the increase of opioid overdose and just the intake of opioids amongst our youth and our young adults. Um, it is a, na a nationwide meth has uh, risen from 30% since 2014 with a 798% increase on chloroquine meth and opioid use. Um, just recently due to this, um, the, the rise in, in meth use, we, also, we just got funded to provide education on primarily focused on meth amongst our youth and across different school districts. Um, next slide, please. 25.2 of LA County's driven deaths involve alcohol. 22% of residents report binge drinking. Zero, uh, zero point, no, sorry, 0 0.7% 0 of residents ages 12 and older report a, a alcohol addiction. 0.5% of residents abuse painkillers for non-medical reasons. Four opioid overdose amongst every 100,000 residents in LA County. 25% of people entering treatment report marijuana as main substance of abuse. And the annual cost of alcohol and drug problems to LA County economy is about 13 billion. Next slide. Our youth and, our youth and family services. So what we offer here, and thanks to the OVC, the victims of crime, just really enhanced the services that we offer at our youth department. Here at our youth department, which is in the city of Santa Fe Springs, like I mentioned early on, we offer um, IOP and outpatient services to any individuals who are from the ages of zero to 24 years of age. Um, we have an intensive treatment service that uh, comprehends of mental health and substance use treatment, as well, like I mentioned, case management. Um, we also have a prevention department <clears throat> that offers prevention misuse education to our local schools, community, just really any community partner that has a group of, of promising youth. We can come out and provide some education on the risky behaviors and the substance misuse portion. Uh, like I mentioned, we offer HIV supportive services to anyone between the ages of um, anyone who's really in need of these services, because it would be hard to say zero to 24, because a zero year old is probably not going to reach out for HIV supportive services, but their parents might. So that is also available. Um, we offer peer advocate trainings as a prevention of efforts. So any participant or patient that comes through our program um, is really empowered to take a, a leadership role in their community. Um, it's, I, we find it key um, that it's important that we empower them and, and show them the importance of, of second chances, right? Um, we offer peer-led support groups. So a lot of, uh, we have a lot of supportive groups that run throughout the day that are led by our alumni or those who are, who are being successful in their recovery. Um, we offer community service, volunteer hours. We have a lot of high schoolers that come by our location that are seeking to provide um, some type of support in their school. So um, they'll like to, they'll take leadership roles and we'll sign off on community service hours um, or volunteer hours. We also have those um, individuals that want to give back to our community. And, and so we also um, welcome them. Right now we are doing um, Zoom platforms, but we do have the capacity to do in-person and via Zoom or should I say telehealth? 
Um, we have a teen center, uh, which we call the homework club here at this location. Any participant who's enrolled in any of our services, even after the completion, so as an alumni, um, we have tutors that volunteer their time. I, there's a certain um, bracket you have to reserve your slot. There's a calendar. You reserve your slot and we make it a point to have a, a volunteer tutor that comes and really just helps you out with uh, anything that you need support when it comes to academically from uh, from elementary, middle, middle school, high school, and college, the basics. Um, and these are either um, employees of LA Cotto or just community volunteers that would like to give up, give back to, to the community. Um, we do pro-social activities. Um, one thing we found was that our adult, our youth were seeking for safe places or invite or places where they can have fun and not feel the pressure of using or abusing substances. Um, and so as a as a team here, they decided to open on Saturday. So we open Saturday mornings from nine to 12 and we do a, we host a pro-social activity. Um, we ask our leadership. So there is a leadership group that's run out of this department that is um, built out of youth between the ages of zero to 24. So really just, we have a different diversity of, of age ranges. And um, we reach out to them on what they want to see, what is it, some what activity would they like to to participate in. Uh, we've surveyed a few of our young adults with this, um, asking same information. What is it that you guys would like to see on Saturdays? How can we support you with your recovery? What else can we do aside from treatment services? More of supportive services. What else can we do for you um, to ensure that you feel confident and secure in this whole process? And so um, they voiced out, we have uh, um, a few requests for just life skills in general um, workshops on things on how um, some of our youth were interested on just different topics like credit, right? Like why credit is important. Um, I remember when we did this survey, there was about 6% and we surveyed about 19 young adults and 6% of them were really interested on real estate and just making money. And there was one kid that comes to my mind and he said, I want to learn how to make money the healthy way. <laughs> so I was like, what does that mean? Healthy way? Explain to me more. And so we went into that. But every time I, I talk about that, it reminds me of him, the healthy way. <laughs> so whatever that looked like for him. Um, we do referrals to MAT services. So we have um, a grant that's the Youth Opioid Response Program that allows us to provide MAT services to our young adults, I'm sorry, our, our youth as well. Uh, anyone between the ages, again, of zero to 24. So our youth and our young adults. Um, next door to our location, we work with a pediatrician that really helps us and monitors the prescribed medication and, and the treatment for MAT services. If you guys are, if you're not familiar with MAT, it's medication assisted treatment. It's primarily for those who suffer from opioid use disorder. Next slide. And so the prevention work, um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, really working on bridging the gaps. Um, part of my duty, which is on this grant, particularly on our victims of crime is the outreach component. Um, and really, as I was hearing as um, other presenters, there was something that stuck out to me. And, um, all these established collaborations and memorandums or understandings really do take a lot of time and effort. Um, I've been in this profession uh, for over 14 years. And as I'm reflecting back and I look at um, everything and all the relationships we have established within the 14 years and now seeing them blossom, I really can say it took about 10 years to really... Um, plant the seed, water the seed, and see this, this tree grow. And, and because of that, I, I'm humble enough to say that building all these and establishing these MOUs have really been easy. Um, we, they see the work that we do. They're seeing our outcomes. Like I mentioned, all of our work is um, used by evidence-based curriculums. We have evaluation teams that evaluate our work. Um, we have multiple different grants from different fundings. Um, and you know how strict and, and, and how they are with meeting objectives and goals and, and proactive. So um, we have a high percentage of change behavior with the curriculum, the evidence-based curriculums that we use across the school districts and community partners. Um, we do a lot of outreach from attending clergy meetings to spa related meetings um, to community coalitions. There's a few community-based coalitions that are run 
um, by a few uh, community partners in our areas that we like to attend and really just be there as support and, and sharing and, and making our services available to those individuals who are in need. The best thing of all this is that all of our services that come out of our youth department are free of service. Um, we do community resource fairs. So here in um, LA County, the restrictions have kind of, uh, the restrictions have kind of, what would I say, easing up a little bit. So we have seen more of in-person community resource events. And um, we participated in a few just in this month. As many of you know, it's Red Ribbon Week. We are across six different um, high schools, middle schools uh, around our, our location or our, our spa, providing education to high school students. And with that is information of the Victims of Crime Program and this free uh, mental health and or substance use services that we have for them. Um, we've participated on other community events like Downey Pride, Whittier Pride, um, National Drug Take Back Day, um, youth conferences, um, Long Beach Pride, and other organization resource fairs. Anywhere we're really we're asked and requested to be there, we, we make it a point to, to provide our support. Um, some of our established MOUs from the youth department are, like I mentioned, um, LA County of Education. We have a few memorandums of understandings with a few high schools, middle schools, elementaries. Um, with cities, we've, um, you know, we know that cities tend to have their um, programs for those individuals who, um, you know, are caught in school or in the community with substance use. They, they're, re they're referred to a community program, so we reached out to different cities. Um, two of our local cities, which is the city of Santa Fe Springs, they have a teen center. This teen center is really, it's really awesome. It's a, it's a teen center. You walk in there and they have, um, you know, just video games, um, computers, um, just a lot of uh, board games, pianos, uh, a lot of great stuff that teenagers, you know, can have fun with. Um, and it's open to any teen within that city. And so what they did is they invited us to come in and, and share with them the services that we have to offer, not only to the, the youth, but also their families um, and their caregivers. And so um, we established an MOU and we're doing that on a monthly basis, um, aside from doing some prevention work with their teens as well. And same modality was followed at the Norwalk Art and Sports Complex. It's the city of Norwalk's um, at-risk youth promising program. And so we do the same there. Um, and then you will see of some pictures of, of some events in the bottom, the National Drug Take Back Day Fair that just happened. And an upcoming one that we have with the local probation department, they'll be hosting a community resource fair and we were invited to table. So when we go out and table, we really just, we make goodie bags because um, they're just easier to get all together and hand them out, you know, COVID compliance, um, put all the, our, our, our flyers in there. But like somebody mentioned, it's sometimes our flyers don't do it all. It's really that person to person contact, um, that phone call, the effort, the being there, that conversation that really makes that difference. So, however, nevertheless, we do assure that they go with resources. And um, one of the resources in this bag, which we call it our resource baggies, um, is the OVC um, flyer and our contact information. And, um, and so, yeah, the next slide. Now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, which he will be talking to you a little bit more of the work we're doing with particularly our OVC contract and their treatment services. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you guys about is uh, how people enter our program, uh, some of the measures that we use, and some of the treatment modalities that we use uh, while we're working with uh, our OVC clients. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So. You know, each state is different. So in the state of California, a minor who is 12 years old can actually seek individual mental health therapy in the outpatient setting if the clinician determines that uh, that person is mature enough for individual therapy. And I think this is important because it, it speaks to our, our outreach program that Jasmine was, was, was talking about. You know, it's Red Ribbon Week, we have a number of our prevention staff that are going out and handing out material to a number of adolescents at various high schools throughout Santa Fe Springs. And, you know, they're letting them know 
that if they want to seek treatment, they don't need parental permission to do that. They can call themselves and enter treatment. Another way that clients can enter treatment is, you know, by their parents. If a parent might hear about our program from a friend or, or from, you know, being involved into another program, then, you know, the parent can call up our main line number and enter treatment that way. Uh, also, uh, entrance to our, our program is done through various professionals. We partner with DCFS. Um, LA CADA has a number of outpatient programs throughout the Los Angeles area. And any you know, client of ours, adult client who has a child is potentially eligible to enter you know, the OVC program. You know, clients are screened for eligibility, you know, be it either by the phone or in person. They come in, they complete our packet, which, which is a 17 page complete biopsychosocial. You know, it sounds kind of daunting, but you know, it's actually pretty easy to navigate. And it also includes uh, things like release of information uh, and all the other legal paperwork that we have to go over. You know, next slide, please. So some of the measures that we use is, um, you know, is the UCLA PTSD index, reaction index. And that's our main measure that we use because you know, we are talking about trauma. And a number of our clients have, you know, identified a, a tremendous, you know, a vast trauma history. Um, and so it's very important that on this measure, that clients can identify the types of trauma, their role in that trauma, some of the brief details about that trauma, and the age range in which they experience that trauma. Also in the reaction index is included a list of PTSD symptomologies. And so they rate those symptoms on a scale of one to four, four being the most extreme, one being not at all. And you know, during treatment, we target those symptoms that they identify. We also target the specific trauma that they identify, you know, that they want to work on. You know, so, you know, the great thing about this measure is that it's given not only to the child, it's given to the parents. So we get two perspectives here. We get the subjective perspective and we get the objective perspective. And this is given over six, you know, it's given every six months. So we get to see, you know, treatment progress. We get to see either the reduction of symptoms or the increase in symptoms. You know, we administer this, this measure to our, our clients who, you know, don't meet criteria for PTSD as well, because PTSD has such a broad, you know, symptom categories, you know, have many different categories. And so chances are they'll have some type of symptom that falls within the, the PTSD criteria. And so we just track those symptoms and we use it less as a diagnostic tool, more as a baseline of identified behaviors. Can you go ahead and next slide, please? So some of the other measures that we'll use, we'll use the pediatric ACEs and real life event screener. So we do use ACEs to identify uh, traumatic areas and a number of our clients identify three or more traumatic areas in their life that they've experienced. We use you know, the IPCANs to identify strengths and needs within that family system. And then as needed, we will administer the anxiety and depression scale. If a child is manifesting anxiety or depression, we'll, again, we'll, administer these scales to the child and to the parents to establish a baseline and then we'll reassess at the six month mark. Now, next slide, please. So our primary um, form of treatment, our EBP is TFCBT, Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy because we are a trauma-informed um, treatment, treatment program. So for those who aren't familiar with TFCBT, TFCBT is a therapeutic intervention designed to help children, adolescents, and their parents overcome the impact of traumatic events. You know, for example, it is designed to help 
with traumas related to sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence, and community violence, an unexpected death of a loved one, natural disasters, and war. So it focuses on you know, treatment to assist the child and adolescent in developing coping strategies for traumatic stress reaction and reduces symptoms of depression, anxiety, or acting out. And as you can see, there are certain phases of the TFCBT process. And throughout this whole process, we're incorporating not only you know, parental training, you know, training on parenting, but we're also incorporating conjoint therapy. So this way uh, I can teach children relaxation skills. And then we can meet with the parents sometimes you know, within the same session or in the next session and go over those skills. So that way the, the parent can reinforce the relaxation coping skills, you know, throughout the work week. You know, again, with affect modulation, we talk about, you know, mood identification, linking the mind and the body. How did these feelings affect your body? Again, we bring the parent into those sessions and we, we discuss, you know, some of the things that we went over, like a child might say, when I feel angry, I clench my fists, or when I feel sad, my heart feels heavy. So, you know, we educate the parent to how the child is manifesting these feelings. And so that way, again, they can go over these, these feelings, you know, throughout the week as well. Um, we discuss cognitive coping styles. So again, because it is a CBT modality, we are looking at cognitive distortions within the traumatic, uh, the trauma narrative. So we go over things like stop thought technique or looking at the evidence. We also go over things like improving their self-esteem and identifying, you know, those cognitive distortions that, that they might have, all or nothing thinking or black and white thinking, you know, things like that. And, you know, we work with the child on developing their own strengths and, you know, exploring new coping skills on, you know, how to overcome these, these cognitive distortions. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the other therapies that we might use, because not every child needs TFCBT. You know, we'll use elements of play therapy because we need to speak the language of the child. And, you know, expecting a child to have the vocabulary of an adult or even the vocabulary of an adolescent is, you know, detrimental to their, the therapeutic process. And so with kids, the language of children is play. And so, you know, we rope in some of the elements of play therapy and we allow the child to explore play and how you know, these themes might come up in the process of play. We also uh, talk about mindfulness, you know, uh, breathing, uh, using your senses, yoga, all these things help with, you know, help regulate the traumatic experience because we wanna teach these kids how to relax. We wanna teach them how to lower their cortisol levels in their brain so that way they can use the cognitive, you know, you know, interventions that we discussed earlier. Because, you know, thinking through a traumatic event doesn't necessarily work. You need to put out the fire before you can work on the problem. And if there's too much stress going on in their brain, if they're anxious, or if they're having other things like dissociation, they need mindfulness. They need to learn grounding skills and some of those things we go over. We use games in therapy, not necessarily as, as a competition, but we use it as springboards for therapy. You know, one of my favorites is using operation. You know, as a child is, is playing operation, I'm, I'm assessing their ability to follow rules, I'm assessing their ability to, to problem solve, I'm looking at their frustration tolerance, and as they pull out a piece, like they might pull out the broken part, now that becomes a springboard for a conversation. It's like, okay, you know, at, at one time in your life, did you feel sad? 
or if they pull out the wishbone, it's like, okay, what are some, what are three wishes that you might have? So again, using things in a creative way. You know, I love using Uno. Uno is one of my favorite games and I love it because it's so portable and I can take it wherever I need to go. And so what I'll do is I'll assign different values to the colors. So I might say, okay, uh, when I flip a red card, we're gonna talk about a time when you were angry. When I flip a blue card, might you know talk about a time when you're sad. You know, when I flip a yellow card, we'll talk about a happy time and so on and so forth. So during the course of play, if I play like, you know, a red five, I might say, okay, tell me about five times that you felt angry. Or if I play a, a, a blue two, I might say, tell me about, you know, a time you felt sad. And where did you feel that sadness in your body? So again, taking something as simple as Uno and turning it into an intervention. I, use, I also use elements of geek therapy. And for those people who aren't familiar, geek therapy is using, you know, themes or items in pop culture as doorways to therapy. It's using things like video games. It's using things like anime. It's using things like Dungeons and Dragons or Star Wars or, or superheroes as ways to you know, navigate through therapy. And, you know, along that mindset, one of the things that I created was an intervention based on the movie Inside Out by Pixar. So, you know, I watched this movie and I thought, you know, here is a fantastic opportunity to teach kids about emotions. I mean, Pixar did a wonderful job in this movie. So, why aren't there worksheets out there? Well, there are. And so I, I, I searched, uh, searched the internet and I didn't quite find what I was looking for. I wanted something that I could use in therapy in say a 15 minute se uh, session and then use the rest of the session, rest of the time in the session to discuss what we had just watched. And so what I did was I, I chopped up, you know, inside out into six, 15 minute segments and each worksheet is designed to focus in on those 15 minutes. So the first 15 minutes, we're talking about stuff like emotion identification, stuff like what's the first emotion that appears, which is joy. And so where did you feel, share a time when you experienced that emotion? You know, what's the next emotion that, that pops up? And you know, in the movie, that's sadness. So again, we'll talk about where do you feel sadness in your body? And so what we've done is, is not only do I use this in session, but this now becomes a tool that the parents can take home and they can watch this movie with their kids and have conversations. So now the adults are learning how to speak with their kids instead of talk at their kids. You know, they are exploring emotions with their child. They're exploring things like the importance of imagination and empathy. And then when we come back in the session in the following week, we can talk about some of the worksheet, you know, things that popped up in the worksheet. You know, and, you know, this intervention is, you know, free. We can pass it out to you guys if you guys are interested. You know, you can shoot us your email. You know, I'm sure Carlos or somebody else can link us up, um, but you know it's, it's it's free. We don't charge anything for this. You know, I don't have a copyright on it. There's no patents pending. You know, so you know if you guys want it, you guys can have it. All right. Um, next slide, please. So you know one of the great things about the OVC is that this gives us an opportunity to target the right clients. You know, drug abuse is, it is, is a family disease. It's not just isolated to the father. It's not isolated to the mother. It's not isolated to the aunt. It's not even isolated to a certain community. And so what we do is with this program, we have a chance to target the right client, which are kids. Because the sooner that we can teach them 
how to manage their stress, how to deal with their trauma, the better off and more healthy they will be. You know, we, we give them the right intervention. So it's not just trauma care, it's whatever works for them. You see, you know, their trauma is what gets them in the door, but if that's not what they wanna work on or what they feel they need to work on, we can work on other issues and eventually get to the trauma. You know, it's the right amount because we're not, you know, there, there is no time frame here. There is no treatment cap with the OVC program. You know, we can spend time. We can spend time building a rapport, building a relationship. So if a, if a client needs 12 sessions, we can give them 12 sessions. If they need 24 sessions, we can give them 24 sessions. If we have a client that needs eight months worth of therapy, we can give them that. You know, you know, and it's at the right price. You know, it's free. You know, theoretically, our clients can receive three years worth of worth of therapy on a weekly basis. You know, not only individual therapy, but case management for the entire family at no cost to the family, at no cost to the individual. Okay, next slide. So our services that we provide are in bilingual. We have brochure materials that are both in English and Spanish, you know, and you know, we, we try to take a multicultural you know, approach to you know, not only the OVC project, but all our projects here at LA Cata. Okay, next slide. So I wanna thank you very much for having us. It's been a pleasure and it's been our honor to uh, present our program to you. And thank you guys for sharing yours. Thank you, Jasmine and Tom. Our next presenter is the Family and Children's Service. And I will turn the floor over to Julie Flannery, who is the Director of Child Welfare and Permanency Services. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here and present with you today. Um, it's been great hearing from all the other grantees, and I hope that we have something to offer you as well. Um, try not to be too excited when I talk about this, but I can honestly say that I'm very passionate about the Safe Baby Court and the partnership that we have. So we'll get to it. Um, like it says on the screen that I'm with Family and Children's Services. I'm the project director for this grant. I have uh, Magistrate Juris Glanton. I am blessed to have the magistrate here to talk with us as well. And Jill Overton, who is our Safe Baby Court coordinator, who's gonna be explaining what Safe Baby Court is. Um, next. So Family and Children's Services has it's been around since 1943. We have a wide range of services, um, but basically the, the gist of the matter is we meet the needs of the changing times, you know, so, as just for like this grant, for example, we saw that the opioid epidemic was not, was not getting any better. Um, the kids were suffering, the families were suffering. So we went for this grant with OVC to see if we couldn't make an impact. Um, 2020 was our deadliest um, overdose year. And as of right now, 2021 is on track to even beat that record. So our, our epidemic is continuing even as we speak. Uh, but our goal in family and children's is, is to connect people from where they're at, whatever they need to what they need to be successful in the future. Um, next. So what we decided to do was to create the CAFE program. And CAFE stands for Confronting Adversity for Future Empowerment. And we came up with that name because we were supposed to be in the schools. This was supposed to be a school-based program. And you know, most teenagers are not going to say, oh, can I go see my therapist? I mean, that's just not cool. So we thought it'd be, okay, can I go down to the cafe for a moment? You know, and they come back with the candy bar or snack and after their session and, you know, take some of the stigma off of it. And I don't think I said it, but we are located in Nashville, um, Tennessee. So, I mean, we had lots of partners at the table. We had Department of Health. I mean, you name it. Um, we just, we had, we had the big plans. And then 
COVID. But not just COVID. Nashville, we got hit in multiple, multiple ways from the racial, from the tornado, very devastating tornado. Um, the Christmas Day bombing, I mean, you name it. It just seems like we weren't able to catch our breath uh, no matter what we were doing. So everybody was just in survival mode. I mean, day to day, the schools closed, the shelter in place, everybody was in survival mode. So we had to, um, next, next slide, please. We had, to, we had to back up and say, okay, hold on. We just got this grant, literally have not had a session yet in the school system. And our schools actually closed two weeks before COVID because of the tornado. So schools are closed, did not reopen again for a year and a half. Um, could not even get into, even do virtual sessions. People were like, well, just do virtual. We, Nashville wasn't prepared for virtual learning. Um, we, they weren't ready for the computers and everything else. So, I mean, it was, a, it was a chore just to get the education and that was the focus. So we could not go that route. So we had to come up with some other strategies. I kind of pestered some people, kind of, um, you know, got out there and call, made call after call after call. You know, and Jill may be the only, may have called me back just because she was tired of me calling her. I don't know, but I'm glad she did, whatever the reason. Um, we, we got to talking after all these other um, outreach efforts and came up with an MOU at the Safe Baby Court. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But um, if you go to the next slide, as Jill and I were talking, the Safe Baby Court, two thirds of these families have substance abuse. And that's probably, this is from the zero to three website. In Nashville, I would say it's even higher. Um, the, the number of ACEs, we're talking four, five, six or more ACEs per family. And like I said, Jill and I met several times and just talking about the generational cycle of poverty and neglect and, and trauma and substance use. You know, we were really seeing, you know, how can we break this cycle? So we created an MOU to work, for us to be able to work with the kids is the way it started. And we've expanded that out. We'll go into a little bit later on, we'll go into more of that. But we started out to work with the children, um, not just the zero to three, but they have siblings. So they have kids all the way up to 18. And they also have these parents who may be 21, 22, 25. So we were working with the entire family involved with that child. Um, with those children and just trying to get the, the children to understand that they didn't cause it, like the seven C's, I was talking about it yesterday, they didn't cause it, but we need to empower them so we can break the cycle. So that was our focus. Um, I'm going to let Jill tell us a little bit about Safe Baby Court next, and then we'll move from there. Yes, and I, I have to say that when Julie um, presented this opportunity for us, it was something that we were aching for. Our court was aching for this more individualized, hands-on approach to work with our babies all the way up and their siblings, um, to work with the whole family, to work with the caregivers, to work with the parents, to help everybody navigate through the trauma that they were experiencing. Because we had found with a few other organizations we were working with, it was more, we were kind of pigeonholed into some, some therapeutic models. So having something that was new and fresh and um, offered different kinds of areas of insight, it was just like, wow. So when I say that we were so excited to see her as much as she was to see us, we needed this. And not only did we need this, our parents, they have connected with our parents in a way that, that our program was, was looking for for the first few years. We started baby court in Davidson County in 2016. It was called an infant court, um, navigated through some grants and moved forward in 2018 when the magistrate Lanton and I were hired to revamp um, the program a little bit under a different grant um, and really look at how we could continue to model after the nationwide zero to three model. So if you ever want to know what baby court's about, you can go to the internet and Google zero to three, and it will take you down a Next rabbit slide. hole. Oh, sorry. No, just have the next slide. Yeah, it'll take you Thank down you. a rabbit hole of information that you'll find out what, where we model ourselves from. And we have that collaborative support with the nationwide Safe Baby Court team as well. So in the state of Tennessee, we have 12 courts now, um, most of which are rural, except for Davidson County and Knox, Knox County, which is Knoxville, Tennessee, 
probably heard of the UT Vols, that's where they're at. Those are two bigger cities that have the safe baby court model, but typically they are the more rural communities. Um, you know, they based a lot of it off the opioid addiction and I will mirror what Julie said. Our families, 90, I, I swear 95% of our cases are um, due to some kind of abu uh, substance abuse issue, um, which doesn't take away from us being able to help with domestic violence cases or environmental hazards and those types of things that families may be experiencing. But it's just the the um, the beast that we're living in right now, the nature of the beast, I guess, that you could say that we're living in right now. But to kind of keep myself to the time limit that I need to, a family um, can enter baby court voluntarily. Um, we are able to bring them in under some... Um, previous uh, kind of um, house rules that we had previous to this, but um, we try to make it voluntary for them. Um, so if a child has a baby in between the ages of zero and three, that's the main end track. Um, and our grant also says that we have to have some kind of Department of Children's Service um, uh, kind of involvement as well, whether it be a petition being filed or some non-custodial services that are in the home, that's part of our grant as well. There has to be a risk that this child is going to go into custody with the department or a risk that the child could be removed from the family and placed with other families, but the department is servicing that family. So that's the buy-in. Um, those petitions come straight to us from the department and from day one, Julie's involved with those families. She jumps on and starts working with them immediately. Um, and, and we um, work within the siblings as well. So you may get a baby and mom has had two or three other children that are already up in their teen years. We're to navigate through their needs and work on individualized plans for everybody in the family unit because they may have some educational needs that have been um, not been looked at or things along that line. So um, our main goal is our main reasoning because it's called zero to three safe babies court is to identify that family's needs on the front end um, to kind of change their parental dynamic to help guide them through new parenting techniques. I always tell them um, you aren't um, here because you know, nobody is the best parent, but we want to help you become the best parent that you can be. What tools can we give you? What, how can we model a plan that's going to be, help you be the best parent and also keep you from coming back through the door again? We've had parents that they've had three or four children terminated on and everyone's given up on them. And then they walk through our door and they see something different in a system, something different that actually caused them to be able to reunify and parent to the best they can because we're not checking boxes. We're not looking at just, you need to do these assessments and go to five classes and we're going to give your kid back. We're looking all the way back to that intergenerational trauma, to, you know, community-based services. We're not just leaving you with just a blanket of information that we've offered you. Um, and, and I'm going to close out with this piece by saying something that Tom talked about a minute ago, time frames. I love that with a cafe, we don't have time frames. I love that with our court, we don't have to necessarily identify, okay, you have to be done within 12 months or you're done with our program. We navigate what that family needs and what that family needs for that child to have permanency and be healthy. So um, I, I, don't, I like that we don't have to pigeonhole ourselves into time frames, but typically it'll run about 14 to 18 months on a typical case. So I'll pause there. Next slide. Magistrate. Okay, so I am Magistrate Jerice Glanton. I am a Nashville native. You will not find that many uh, in Nashville when you come here, unfortunately, but I, I'm an original. <laughs> and I think Julie is from uh, the Middle Tennessee as well, correct? All right. Um, so what we do in baby court, I am the Magistrate, and as Jill said before, things are different as soon as people walk into the courtroom. Um, up until COVID, so until June 2020, we met at the Juvenile Court Building, which sits right beside the Nissan Stadium. And we met in a room that's like a party meeting room at court. So when the families walked in, they did not see a bench. Um, they did not, they saw me in a robe, but they saw me in a robe that was unzipped. They, um, we used to have court on Fridays pre-COVID. So I asked uh, the big judge, Judge uh, Sheila Calloway, if we could wear jeans. 
And she was like, absolutely, because we wear jeans to work on Fridays. And so I had on jeans and tennis shoes on most Fridays when we had court. Um, now we do court on Mondays. I am, I have to dress up on Mondays because it's not dressed on Friday. But we've moved buildings into our um, truancy center, our student attendance center, and I still wear my robe open. I, um, we still don't have a bench. We sit pretty much at um, tables, not very unlike normal court. So our first goal when parents and families walk in is for them to get the feeling, oh wait, this doesn't look or feel the way it normally feels when I go to court, whether that be juvenile court or criminal court. Um, we pride ourselves on really um, bringing the families in and making them feel comfortable try almost immediately. We do take cases where a mom may have had removals, numerous removals, or uh, an extensive history with the department, because what Julie, Jill, and I can do versus, unfortunately, what the department can do as far as getting buy-in are two totally different things, because, unfortunately, with, with DCS, our parents are afraid of them, and um, they, they fear them, and sometimes they do not like them. And so we kind of swoop in to kind of help the department navigate these cases in a way that puts the families back together. Our first goal is always to reunify the parent with uh, the parent and the child. We have monthly court hearings, which is a little different than normal court processes. Jill also holds a family meeting every month as well. So that means that every two weeks, these families are getting touched. We run a small caseload, uh, about 20 cases uh, at a time, and then we just kind of roll them in and out. We um, participate in Jill, not we, I do not. <laughs> Jill participates in pre and post removal uh, CFTMs or conferences. She, as I mentioned before, they do the monthly CFTMs. If they have to have emergency CFTMs, she is able to hold those if issues come up. Um, our goal is to get services and really learn these families in an effective and efficient way, not necessarily a quicker way. And also to kind of find these children permanency to where they don't have to be removed or, you know, jump from house to house to house or family member to family member. When they come in, I ask tough questions. I let their attorneys know, please warn your client that it's not something necessarily that I'm gonna write down. But if I ask a family or a parent, what is your drug of choice? How long have you been using drugs? It is not to punish them. It is not to make fun of them. It is so we know as a team what we're working with because unfortunately having a parent that has been using um, opioids or heroin, heroin for 15 years versus marijuana for three, that's two totally different situations for us to handle in our court program. Um, we Jill, Jill's job is to... Um, navigate services. So if we have a parent that comes in, like we've had recently, a parent came in and said, I just was not getting anything out of um, this, this, this mental health provider. I, I didn't learn anything. I wasn't retaining anything. We've been able to make those connections with private services. And since we are grant funded, we get a little bit of money to be able to pay for certain things for assistance for to our families. Um, and we were able to switch that mom to uh, individual therapy. A therapist person to where they're not sitting in the group therapy session um, and where she feels like now that she's getting a lot more out of it because it's more individualized. Um, we also, sorry, I'm trying to make that check away. I've done things in, in making court more comfortable, we really go above and beyond. Pre-COVID, we would serve food at every meal. That was also due to the fact that sometimes our parents would be actively in addiction, and this could be their only meal they get that day. If I had a last case or a case that had a lot of children or siblings or something like that, if we had food left over, I'm sending that food with that family or with that foster family um, to take home because it's more food, it's food for them to eat. I have had court in the park numerous times for uh, children and families who just coming into court was just too much of a trigger. I do have to see children um, monthly and that we also use it as a time for visitation as well. So one other piece of the program is increased visitation. Our goal is as much family time as possible. And sometimes people frown upon that. 
parents are shocked when we tell them that. Um, parents are shocked when, you know, I may get a case a month in after a petition has been filed by DCS and they've only seen their child, um, their infant four times for two hours every week. And when I hear that, I come in and I, I may roll my eyes. And, but everyone's prepared for me to roll my eyes if I hear hear those those time frames. And I'm like, I would like for mom to see her kid eight hours a week. Like, and that's not even enough. Um, and so it, it's just things like that, that we really, really foster to try to um, enhance the relationship and the bonds between um, parent and child. And I think someone asked a question about the therapies. Jill is probably better to answer that. Well, I know Julie just started a therapy. I don't know if it's CBIT. We <laughs> PCIT. That's it. Yes. Um, we do have some, we had some families um early on go through um CPT. And that therapy for some of our families, uh, it worked. And for some of our families, it didn't. We noticed that the families that it didn't work were the ones that were illiterate, the ones that um maybe were um uh hadn't really went that moms with eighth grade educations or even less. And so we had to look, we were so happy when Julie came along because we had to look for something else because our families were getting deemed for in court for not, for not being able to apply that type of therapy. Um, and so now it's like, I, I have families come in and like, oh yeah, I know, I know them. She was just at my house last night or I talked to her and she was, you know, she came over. I'm really learning a lot from Julie's team and I appreciate everybody. And so it, it's just kind of been a 360, but we, we do PCIT, C, CPT, um, anger management, um, domestic violence therapy, and counseling, um, alcohol and addiction um, counseling, mental health from all all ranges, and we still have some. We will have some families that are in a suboxone clinic or something like that, and um, they they see their therapist there normally once a month while they're getting their um, medications every week. Jill, did I miss anything? I'm gonna follow up in a moment after Julie's next slide. Okay. Okay, next slide then. Now, I know it's hard to see this, um, but basically this is the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework. And that's really where we come from on a daily basis with these families. I mean, we all know we cannot do one hour of therapy a week with the child or the parent and call it good. I mean, that's, that's just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, no family can be sitting here trying to process their trauma if they're hungry, they don't have the basic needs met, um, you know, they're having school issues or whatnot. So we really look at building up the parents' re um, parental resilience by teaching them. Some of these parents did not have any role models. So when you have no role models, you don't know how to be a parent. That is not something that is just innately built into us. Um, so, I mean, we had one the other day in court that said, I've never had a school-aged child. I'm learning this. And that is so true. I mean, how would you know what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to coordinate with schools and everything else unless you had somebody walking you through it? Um, a lot of the parents are, are lonely. We try to connect them with other, other people that are in um, healthy relationships because if they're getting out, if they're in recovery, they're getting away from their previous gang of folks. And now who do they have to hang with? You know, so a lot of them are very lonely. So we try to get them connected up with the social activities, um, getting that same thing with the kids, get the kids interested in some other activities for as a prevention model. Um, we do work with the kids on um, TFCBT. I have some wonderful therapists that work with these kids on whichever therapy best meets their, meet, their needs. Play therapy, um, like I said, we use the seven C's. We use, uh, Timby talks about addiction. Yeah, if anybody hasn't seen that, you need to go on the Timby Talks, T-I-M-B-I Talks website. Um, that is a great resource. Um, but we try to educate the parents on what's normal. What is a normal toddler? What's a normal preschooler? What's a normal school-age kid, you know? 
normal teenager, that's a whole different world. I don't know that there is such a thing <laughs> coming from somebody that has one. But we try to give the families the information that they need because we all need it. You know, we try to just meet them where they are. All, every one of these families wants to do what's best. They just don't know how sometimes. Um, so we work with Jill. Jill might say, hey, can you help me find um, a bed? I mean, if th this family didn't have a home, they got on the, the uh, public housing waiting list, they got a home, and now what? I mean, we had a assembly group of what, four moved in, and literally they had a blanket. So, you know, how, how, do, how much would that help the parents' dignity and self-worth to be able to put her children to sleep that night in a bed with a blanket and a pillow? You know, so we, we get those things. We, we use the community resources or whatever it takes um, so that we can put all of those pieces together. It's not a matter of this is a broken puzzle and we got to put them together. We have to go find some pieces sometimes and build that puzzle back for, for the families. Um, Jill, you want to add something there? Um, no, I think everything that you said is exactly how we feel our court should run, very individualized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and in regards to some of the um, assessment tools that we use, I know somebody asked what a CFTM, CFTM meeting is, and that's a child and family team meeting, um, which gives us the opportunity to navigate what's working, what's not working, what's missing. Um, like I said, how can we help you be the best parent you can be? Um, and, and yeah. And one of the things that, that magistrate does, I mean, she will look at the person straight in the eye and say, what do you need? Mm -hmm. How many judges do you know will ask the person standing in front of them, what do they need? You know, and the parent might say, I need size four diapers. And she'll say, no, I ask, what do you need first? We got to take care of you before you can take care of the four-year-old or whatever. Um, and you just don't see that, but that makes a huge difference. The parents immediately feel like, hey, we're in this together. They're with me. We're okay. lucky. Yeah, having access to someone that's not going to judge them. Um, myself nor the magistrate judge these parents at all. We're not taking your visits away if you're dirty. We're going to make sure you're not high at the meet at the visit, but you're not going to lose your your progress. Yeah. You know, we're just going to revamp and and head in a different direction that we need to. Oh, you didn't use heroin this week. You only smoke weed. Yay! I mean, we're screaming yeah. at the top of our lungs in court to make sure that they're receiving some prices that they've never, like, people look at me sometimes, they're like, you're a real human being. And it's like, we're all human. There's yeah. nothing that made you different, except you're in a different situation than I am today. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that's how we work with the families. They do trust us at times, most of the time. I'm gonna try to answer some of these questions. I don't know where we are on time or next slides or things like that. So when it comes to family time as quality, I do not like for people to visit in public pretty much unless it is a park with an age appropriate kid. I will blow a gasket if I found out the kids went to McDonald's to play on the play, play thing or Chuck E. Cheese unless it's a birthday party. So we do have a visitation space um, which is at one of our local centers, which is in front of my high school, actually. Um, so I am very familiar with the area, but we, we, if parents need a place to visit that is not the DCS office, or if, if foster parents cannot foster that visit, then we send them to the, to the visit, visitation space where there's a couch and there's a refrigerator, and then there's a bassinet and there's other things for babies and there's toys, a little playhouse, and it sits mm -hmm. in, in, on the outside of is a gym. So we have space for these visits to occur. We also do visits at court sometimes. So if I find out or Jill finds out that a family, we, we're getting a new case and they haven't seen their baby for a week or two, we will not schedule something before or after. So that family can come in early and have that time to to see their child um yeah. some of the challenges think, go ahead i think they're well i think they're going to do some of the questions at the end okay well <laughs> I, no no that's fine um go ahead to the next slide at the moment please go ahead jill Oh, yeah, sorry. So um, it, 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 from some of the successes that we have, it seems that our families do reach permanency a little bit quicker. And I think um, that's because we do identify the true needs of that family. Um, and I do, we do identify those protective factors and those strengths and rely on figuring out 
what their ACEs are, um, what is their past trauma. Um, and I have attached the um, website that'll give you some of our data across the state of Tennessee. That's all 12 counties. If you just wanna look over some of the, the, the areas of race, the areas of addiction, mental mm -hmm. health. Um, I know there was a question about some mental health and those types of areas, um, but that'll give you some kind of idea about um, data that we look at. But even in the year 2020, um, we increased the amount of cases in children that we were able to service. Um, we look at um, different areas of even biases within the providers that we use. We run across racial bias or um, different types. There are many types of bias, but we run across those and are able to identify that that resource might not be the best fit. And we're able to figure that out and give the family a trusting place to figure that out. Um, mm -hmm. I've recently been, and some of our families, our, our other coordinators have been through the FAN training, which is um, facilitating um, attuned interaction in our meetings. So we're not just, um, I, I don't know how many of you guys have been in Department of Children's Services meetings where it's, here's what you did, here's what you need to do, what have you done? That's not how we run our meetings. It's more about, let's talk about what's going on in your life. Do a little bit of meditation, a little mindfulness at the beginning. And it feels like a familial group. It's not about pointing fingers. It's about getting to the crux of what's, what's needed and where we're at. We have um, toddler infant needs assessment tools that we use. Um, Family Children's Services has a ton of their own assessments that they kind of bring to us to make sure that that we're hitting all of the factors that we need to within our families. But um, like I said, we last year we served, we run about 20 cases in a given year, like at a time, not throughout the year. And we served about 25 um, cases, about 53 um, individuals, children during that time frame. So um yeah, like she said, everybody gets a voice. Um, it's not mm -hmm. just the people from the department that are coming in and saying, um, this is what you did wrong. That That's not kind of how we run things. Next slide. Well, and I think the, the other thing that I want to add with what Jill was just saying is, and I think um, Tom might've been who said it earlier, the ripple effect. That's really the reason why I'm so excited about this partnership that we have, because it's it, we're, yes, we're helping the kids, we're helping the, the families that the kids are placed with, but then there's also aunts and uncles and cousins and other people that come that are part of this family that we're touching, the foster parents, the schools, the com other communities. I mean, this, it's, it ripple, the ripple effect is going out. So hopefully we can make the difference for that, not just generational, but the intergenerational um, progress along the way. So we just want to thank you guys for listening and hope we've uh, provided something for you today. Thank you so much, Julie and, and Jill and Magistrate Lanton. Um, our next presenter is the Child Protector Mercer County, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ladina to kick off the presentation. Hi, everybody. How's everyone? Um, I, I'm Ladina Morgan. Um, we are with um, Child Protect of Mercer County. That's the Child Advocacy Center. And we are a branch of that, which we are called Starting Points. Um, so what we did when we were working at Child Protect in 2018, we had pretty much established the CAC. Um, so we decided to meet with our local community partners um, to just kind of do an assessment of what we may need in relation to like the opioid crisis that was going on. Um, when we met with them, uh, we met with CPS, law enforcement, prosecutor's office, guardian ad litems, and other community partners that we work with daily. Um, and they said that they felt that the, in Mercer County, we really needed a supervised visitation program. At that time, we had two providers that were doing that kind of work, um, but there was actually no set place to do the visits. They were going to uh, McDonald's playgrounds, uh, play play sets to do the visits or our mall, which has a little small play area um, to do those visits. So we decided that at that time we would go ahead and try to start opening up uh, a visitation center. Um, I think that there was 700 visits um, court ordered to happen each month in 2018 and less than 5% of those were actually at a designated location. 75% um, of those cases 
were also drug related. Next slide. Um, next slide, sorry. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the first thing we did was try to find a location for our visitation center because we knew that we wanted to mirror it with the CAC and have that be in a home-like setting to where we can actually simulate how the visits would go when they were actually reunified or if they were reunified with their families um, to be able to continue those practices that we were hoping to help them with. Um, so we found a building that was actually right up the street from our child advocacy center. Um, it took a while for us to get that building. Uh, we finally did. Um, so, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so we finally got that building. Um, we actually did all the work ourselves. We tore out carpet. We painted. Um, what else did we do? We got new flooring. New flooring. Oh, we had to have it all um, rewired electrically. And uh, luckily, our um, Botech pro program did that for free for us. Um, so we finally got our building up and running. We met back with CPS, which was the um, actual um, the heads, the, the head people who wanted this to, to happen, visitation services. Um, we told them that we were ready for referrals and we received maybe two referrals from them. So we knew that we had to kind of rethink um, how we were going to work. So we kind of needed to build some new partnerships because obviously we're not going to just have two, two visits per year um, being referred from CPS. So we sent out, um, we we prepared a letter and sent it to our family court judges. And that's when it really kind of took off and started. Um, we were receiving about 10 referrals a week at that time. Um, so even though there was a pandemic going, we knew that we couldn't, you know, we can't provide visits, visitation services from home. Um, and so we all worked through the pandemic during that time. Um, and our numbers really didn't fall after we um, met with the judges in, in the family court. Next slide. So this is just the outcomes of our first year of doing visitation here at the Starting Point Center. Um, the total referrals we received for visitation services, most of those had come from circuit court and family court and a few from our local CPS. We received 60 referrals. When we receive these referrals, we have the visiting party and the residential parent come in and fill out paperwork. So the numbers for substance abuse and the domestic violence were gathered from um, that paperwork itself reported as well as the court orders we received. So cases with reported substance abuse were 75% of our cases. The cases with reported domestic violence was 73%. Um, during this time frame, we were able to schedule 664 visits. Um, throughout the year, we had a total of 44 cases that were closed, the reasons for closing. 26 of those closed because of reunification. And then we had cases that needed home providers. They were granted weekend visitation. So that was three. And then we had a few clients who just failed to continue to come to visits so that we had 10 of those closed because of that. We actually had one visiting parent pass away and we had four families move out of state. Next slide. So at our facility, we also have emergency um, resources. We have on-site food. We have a blessing box outside if for after hours if we're not here. We have clothing basic needs. We also receive donations of like household items. We've received washer and dryers, um, furniture, and different things to give out. We also offer different support groups. We have one going on right now at the local high school. We've had parent support groups as well where we help where we teach them parenting skills. Um, and then at our sister office down the hill, we offer free therapy services. So if we are working with a family for visitation 
and we feel like they can benefit from those therapy services, we can make a referral down the hill to them as well. And then throughout the year, we have different events that we work with the community to put on. We have our baby shower event that happens for expecting mothers every April. We also have a backpack drive to give out backpacks and school supplies to the local kids in our community. And I'm blanking. Um, we do blessing we box. do a blessing box. Um, so it's Thanksgiving items in a box for Thanksgiving food. And then each year during Christmas, we also do some sort of Christmas activity. Last year we did shop with a cop and we plan to do that this year as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so next year um, in for our future growth of our program, um, we're gonna try to grow our supervised exchange prop, um, services. We really hadn't planned on doing supervised exchanges, but when um, the judge, the judges called us and asked if we would be willing to try, we, we went ahead and accepted that. Um, and so we, that's something that they are expressing to us that they would like us to, to, to provide more of. So we're going to try to do those and it, just um, expand that. Um, we're going to also start having free therapy here at our office for um, our non-custodial caregivers. And that will start in 2022. Um, we have one thing that we did realize when we first started visits was that this office, um, while at first it seemed like it was going to be big enough with the amount of referrals that we were receiving became very, very small. So we knew we were going to have to either find a new space or add on. And because this space is so homey, again, it's on a residential street, um, you know, parents can come in, they can cook for their kids when they want to. Um, bake cakes, they can do their laundry while they're wait, while they're conducting their visit, um, all those things. We really didn't want to have to look for another home that was going to um, be able to provide all those services like, like this place had. So we're going to have an 1,800 square foot office expansion. Um, they've actually started working on it. Um, it's pretty much up. And of that, 100% of the $200,000 space expansion was raised by all of our local donors and gifts from the community. So um, one thing that we really are, I am very thankful for is that we have such great community partners and they have really just like embraced us and um, supported us through our, this whole process. And um, I'm really proud of all the girls that we have working here and it's just been kind of a wild ride. <laughs> uh, next slide. So this first video is actually one of our clients that we had who received supervised visitation at our center, as well as emergency um, referrals here for household items. And her case actually closed because of reunification. So we did an interview with her. If you could play the first video. Okay, how uh, were you referred here to starting points? Um, and report. Okay, what were you referred for? For uh, visitation with my son, and then um, I was going through the court system because um, my in-laws had temporary guardianship, and I wanted to get the, regain custody with my son. So we started out visits here at Starting Point once a week, and that's how our process started. They referred us to Starting Point to do supervised visitation. Okay, and can you tell me the reason um, behind why they had custody of him? Like what was the reason, was it? Well, I had been in trouble with um, addiction and substance abuse and I um, was doing good. I had been clean for about probably six months. And so I went and I, I figured it was better to go through the court system because we had a lot of bad blood was in the family during the time. Things weren't very well. And I wanted to do things the right way as well. So I went to family court and I got the modification packet and started the process. When we went to court, um, I had, you know, I had all the proof and stuff that I needed uh, about my recovery. And so they granted me visits once a week, supervised, and referred me to starting point. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about how your visits went here? Well, they were great. Um, I was very thankful for the visits here. Like everybody was so welcoming. We were comfortable. We played games. We cooked. We just sat and talked. We 
done outside activities and it was it gave us the time to be able to bond where it, it made us able to, to get that time to be able to bond and to slowly transition into us being able to get back together and reunite because everything was just so difficult and it gave the support that he needed with for like with the Bennett's and with me and it gave us time to heal and to work together and to get along with each other because they seen how I was doing and they seen you know the attempts that I was making plus I had documentation from you guys showing you know it's, it's kind of like evidence proving you know that I was capable of being able to be a full-time guardian for him again you know full-time mother okay so can you tell us why your visits ended here well, it ended because I regained full custody again. So after, like, um, we probably had about, I'll say maybe like 10 one, once a week visits, and then they granted overnight visits. And we done the overnight visits for probably a couple of months, and then that, we went back to court, and right before school, they granted me full custody again, and he got to stay with me full time. That's been for about two months, like two months ago now. Um, have you ever used any of our emergency, emergency referrals or needs here? Services? Yes, the, um, the furniture that you guys provided me, you know, with furniture and things that I needed for my house that helped me out tremendously. Um, I was working, but still, you know, trying to get established again and get started is rough. So it helped me tremendously with the, you know, the support and the furniture and things that helped furnish my trailer for me in and now. Thank you, too. Our next video is actually our local family court judge that we received referrals from. Alrighty, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Certainly. Uh, my name is Judge Lisa Clark. I am one of the family court judges for the 12th Circuit in West Virginia. I was elected about 14 years ago, so I've been on the bench for a while now, and we handle uh, cases regarding children, divorce, custody, child support, alimony, equitable distribution, contempt, those sorts of issues, as well as domestic violence cases. Okay, and then can you tell us about um, in what manner you work with Starting Points? Starting Points has been such an asset to our community. Before the Starting Points program, we had no supervised visitation program in our county or in Magdow County, which is the neighboring county. Uh, this makes it extremely difficult when you're trying to assess cases regarding custody and shared parenting time. So what Starting Points has been able to do in hundreds of cases so far, and I do mean hundreds, is they've been able to ascertain the relationship between the parents or guardians and the children. And I really use their services as much to prove good parenting as I do to prove not so good parenting. Um, I find the uh, workers at starting points to be very professional, extremely educated um, in this area. They're able to take such detailed information and translate it into a very cogent report for my staff and I to, to review on a weekly basis. Uh, very thorough. They're really an asset to the court system and the children of this county. Okay, can you tell us what kind of client you would refer to starting points? We refer um, litigants who are unable to co-parent. Um, a lot of times there are larger issues than the actual parenting skills at work. There are interpersonal relationship issues. And of course, let's face it, if they didn't have any issues, they'd still be together. Um, but this service allows us to really get an understanding of the relationship between the parent and child and to determine if there's any uh, trepidation, any fear, with the children if the parent can uh, appropriately interact with the children if they're using the right words um, and I frequently 
over the years have looked to professionals such as the people at Starting Points for the right words in dealing with uh, children. So they've really been um, super successful in cases regarding domestic violence, even, I'm going to call it facilitating supervised visits as much as it's a supervision, it's a facilitation because they can point out to parents that perhaps that's not the most productive way to talk about the other parent with this child. They can make suggestions. So in that way, I feel that they're more facilitators than actual supervisors, even though that is, that is the role. Okay, are there any other issues that these parents face other than like issues between each other? Um, are there other issues that they have like going on in their lives typically? There are a lot of different issues. What we're finding, especially it seems since the pandemic hit, uh, a bevy of mental health issues that I didn't really notice in the past or they weren't really so prevalent, but uh, they're able to key in to different mental health issues that the parents may be having and then perhaps we can refer the parent out for additional mental health services uh, if need be. Okay, and what are some reasons that um, parents would no longer use starting points on both the good spectrum and the not so good spectrum? Well, the easiest answer is parents who refuse to comply and cooperate uh, with the services. Uh, for whatever reason that might be, that is reflected negatively in my rulings. Um, I expect the parents and uh, guardians, sometimes grandparents as well, to be cooperative and compliant with all the orders of the court. Um, we would no longer need starting points, very helpful services, if one parent is able to see the other parent has a good relationship with the child. If we're able to demonstrate that that parent is interested, involved, engaged, willing to do the work, put in the time so that they can get to a more expanded, unsupervised, or facilitated shared parenting schedule. Okay. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add about visitation services at starting points or the clients that we work with? the dynamics here in Southern West Virginia or anything that you find, might find pertinent to know? Well, uh, one final point with regard to starting points is how active they have become in the community uh, since they've been here. Um, as a member of the Rotary Club of Princeton, we've participated with them in some very successful backpack projects um, for school children. I believe this year was somewhere in the neighborhood of between seven and 800 backpacks that were distributed I know they've also done a community baby shower, which was wildly popular. And um, of course, they're a, uh, a branch of Child Protect, which just celebrated its late 20th year uh, in Mercer County. So we're very fortunate to have this program for our children and families. All right, thank you so much. Thank you guys for you. letting us talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to open up the floor for questions at this time. And just a reminder, if we do not get to all the questions, we will um, go ahead and develop a FAQ and um, share the answers out with everyone who's in attendance. So the first question is for Lakata. Can you talk about how you engage parents in doing the TFCBT therapy with their children? Do you ever have to do TFCBT with other caregivers in addition to the parents? Uh, sure. Um, the way we do it uh, with TFCBT is it all starts with psychoeducation. And it, and it all starts with talking and educating the parents and the kids about what trauma is and how trauma affects the brain. So right from the get-go, we are incorporating the parents and the caregivers in the care of the child. Then, you know, throughout the course of the treatment, what we also do is we enroll in the parents as, as we work with kids on developing coping skills. As we, you know, as say uh, during the relaxation phase, I, I work with children on how to breathe, how to do diaphragmatic breathing. 
and relaxation breathing. Uh, so we'll practice that in our session. And then, you know, we'll bring in the parent if the parent's available. And, you know, we'll teach the parent, say, okay, this is what we practice. Let's, let's breathe together. And so we'll spend a minute or two just breathing. And, and then I'll turn it back to the parent. I'll turn my focus back on the parent. I'll say, this is a skill that your son or daughter has identified that helps them when they're angry or helps them when they're crying or helps them stay calm. And what I'd like you to do is practice this. You know, I encourage you to practice it right before they go to school. You know, take five minutes before they go to school and just breathe or right before bedtime, or both, you know? So that way you're reinforcing that training. The other thing that we do in TFCBT with parents is, you know, we have separate parenting sessions where we just talk about their parenting style. Because what we wanna do is we want to help decrease home stress. Because you gotta remember trauma is all about you know, elevated cortisol levels in the brain. And so if, you know, a kid who's, you know, any child, but particularly a child that's been experienced, exposed to trauma is in a, in a home where the standard communication style is yelling across the room. Now you're talking about a kid that's exposed to complex trauma on a daily basis. So maybe we need to change the family's communication style. You know, or, you know, maybe my client was traumatized by someone wearing red and the mother insists and the mother doesn't know this. And so the mother insists on putting a red blanket on the child every night. Well, every night that mom is inadvertently triggering that child. And so, you know, I get a chance to educate them about the, the child's triggers. The other thing that I could do with parents is talk about their own trauma experience. Because, you know, chances are if, if a child is traumatized, then the, then the parent might be traumatized as well. And depending on the type of trauma, they might have been traumatized by the same event. So now, you know, I'm talking to the mom about regulating her trauma. And then, you know, talking to the kid about regulating their trauma. So, and lastly, and... In TFCBT, one of the final stages is the child sharing their narrative with an identified adult. So, you know, at this stage, you only have to, you only want one specified adult. So you're not putting too much pressure on the kid. Everything else, the whole family can be involved. So, you know, I'm sorry if I'm answering too long, but you know, that that's basically it, you know. You, you roll the family in at whatever stage you can. Mm -hmm. um, this question is for the Safe Baby Court team. Can you speak to challenges when working with parents and families where there are multiple issues such as co-occurring substance use, domestic violence, and major mental health issues? Do you have any advice for supporting these families with complex issues that overlap like this? I'm gonna let you go first. Okay. Um, what what I do from the bench is recognize um, and make sure that I verbally say something around. I notice these issues, or I know that this has been a struggle. So the families know that I am not ignoring it. That I um, I see it, and I, I know that it may be a challenge for them. To, to deal with everything. We also try not to do so many services at one time. So if I have a family or a parent that's going to need all of the assessments and have to do all these recommendations, then we try our best to say, okay, hey, if you have some type of income or if you're staying with your mom, or if you're staying somewhere where well, you don't necessarily have to work, I'm not gonna add that on your plan right now because let's get you mentally healthy let's get you um get you in, in at some point in in your recovery to where you are able to hold down a job or, or something like that but let's not do that right now and try not to focus on that and we're gonna 
we're going to provide whatever we can provide, like, you know, bus passes. And, you know, we have grant money to kind of get cars fixed and help you get your licenses back. So we try to do all that type of stuff up front to kind of circumvent all these other issues or all these other um, assessments or programs that you're going to be doing at the same time while you're also trying to work to get your children back. Um, Julie? Well, and I think from, from a therapy standpoint, I mean, we try to have just brutally honest conversations with the parents about the best interest of the child. I mean, you know, it's, it's different if they're, you know, been in the safe baby court for a week as opposed to a year. You know, these families that have been in here for a year, the, the child has been growing up basically in the foster home. We do have that honest conversation. You know, I understand you want your son back, but what are what's your next step and try to make these make the the goals that they can reach um that are attainable in a short amount of time and then see what the long term is i think somebody did the hope worksheet yesterday i mean really that's kind of what we do we give them the hope but at some point in time you have to have that honest conversation to say we your son needs permanence you know it's only fair to him while you get yourself together not saying you shouldn't be part of his life. We can figure out how that can still happen, but we, we, we have to have those honest conversations as well. I also try to make a good effort to keep the case open as long as I can to make sure that we're involved long enough to where the parents like that. I'm giving, I'm giving them chances. I give them a lot of chances. The department says I give them way too many chances. But in reality, we know that the studies show that if the, if the child is in DCS custody or when they turn 18, that they're going to go back home. They're going to go back to mom and dad. They're going to find mom and dad. That's where they're going to grow up in their 18 plus years. Um, so we still try to do our best to make sure that we're still helping the parents as much as we can, even if at some point they decide or we decide, I can't keep the case open long enough, but this is what we're going to do. We've had quite a few cases um, have open adoptions. We've had quite a few cases cases go to permanent guardianship with family or friends that allows the, that parent to still stay involved with their children's life and also keeps it open besides the adoption part. But when they go uh, permanent guardianship or just custody to a family member, they're able, whenever they get it together and can prove to the court that... Um, They've done everything they need to do. They're able to petition the court on their own at that point. And we, we will come back in and, and reevaluate and see what's all been done to see if, if, if it's time to return the children to, to the parents. Great. Thank you so much. We have a question for Child Protect. Where do most of your, of your referrals come from? What percentage of your referrals are included in court orders? So most of our referrals for visitation come from our family court system here from our family court judge, as well as the circuit court judges. Um, that's a vast majority of them. I'm not sure exactly what percentage it is, but I know since we've started doing the supervised visits here, we've received at max five from CPS. All the rest has come from the court system. And a couple of guardian items. Yeah. And, um, so here in our county, the guardian at litems on the cases, they will do the orders on some of the cases so that they'll put in the order that they want the visitation to occur here. Great, thank you. Um, another question for Lakata. Even though youth can seek and consent to mental health treatment at age 12, Parental rights may not have been terminated and parents may want information about their children, particularly if a child is placed out of the home. How do you handle this? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, I was just typing about that. Um, you know, first off, I, if a child is removed from the home, we, we work directly with the DCFS, you know, social worker. You know, we want the family to be informed. We want, you know, everyone to know what's going on in a healthy way. Uh, but we also want to do it legally. Generally, what, what I work with, even when I'm working with parents who have custody with kids, um, to ensure my child's, uh, my client's confidentiality, um, first off, I get a release of information, you know, standard. 
Um, and then I usually just tell them generally what we're working on. You know, we're working on relaxation skills. We're working on, you know, stress in the home, you know, things like that. You know, yeah, not give them too many details. It's the same thing that when you're, when you're writing sort of a, a summary of care, you know, you don't go into the details about the care. You, you talk about generally about the care, you know, child, you know, came to us because they were seeking some problems in the home, they're having some behavior issues, or there was some, you know, you know, they have problems regulating their moods. And so we're working on them on regulating their moods and their behaviors. Thank you, Tom. Um, another question for the Safe Baby Court team. Uh, I love that many strategies that you have implemented to make families feel more comfortable and less threatened. How have these been received by other judges and child welfare staff who are used to more traditional court processes? Well, That's excellent. it is a good question. Luckily, we have tough skin. <laughs> um, court officers tend to call our court the warm and fuzzy court. Um, for us, I don't mind any of the criticism, I guess, that, that we get from it, but it is a lot different than the normal court process, even being different, like for, for Davidson County, when we have settlement, um, most of the time, the parents never step foot in that courtroom up until when COVID happens. And now we have to do everything on a block schedule. So all cases get like 30 minutes. But before then, you're outside and you're either setting your date for trial or you're taking a plea. Your attorney handles that. You, you never see anybody. You don't even see the judge necessarily because he may or may not do docket call. He or she may not do docket call. So it's a huge difference with the parents. They like being able to talk. They like being able to um, know who's on their case, even with the transitions that happen right now um, with, with what child welfare is kind of going through with the transition of caseworkers and a lot of our agencies. Um, they just, the parents love it. Attorneys do not like how long the cases last necessarily. They do not like um, having to come to court, <laughs> Is it, which is Sounds bogus, but they do not like necessarily having to be present with, with their clients and be present with their clients in CFTMs because some some attorneys do like to do these, do um, CFTMs by phone, but their client may show up because their client's child may show up. And um, I kind of require my attorneys to be present. Uh, unless we're doing Zoom court, we, we kind of want everyone who is detrimental for the case to be be there in person. And that has caused some issues, especially during COVID, because people really, really liked visiting, I mean, liked doing a virtual court. But for our families, it was not really conducive for them at all. They needed to be seen, they needed to be touched, they needed to be hugged if it was a mask or shaking hands or fist pounding, they needed that. So that, that was a struggle for us. Um, Julie? Yeah, I would totally agree. I think you've had a couple of attorneys that you said just the amount of time that it takes as opposed to, you know, once every six months or whatever when they go to court on some of the other cases. You will cap out. We we do our attorneys that take the appointed cases. You will cap out a lot quicker definitely having a case in my court than you would the normal track. The cases can still last just as long as, as if you were not in baby court, it's just that you're seen more frequently so that those hours build up a lot quicker. Um, but I'm working with our AOC here to try to get CLE hours. I've asked numerous times to let them bill, to not have a cap <laughs> and let them bill like every, every two months or monthly because they're there. And I'd have to check their work anyway, their hours. So if someone posts something that says that they're, they've they been in court this amount of time, I'm gonna know whether or not it's true. But that's still a fight with the AOC that we're going through, but I'm definitely trying. Um, I think that's everything. But it, it, it has been a struggle. It is different. Um, it's It was different even at my DCS attorney you know, when we were doing court in the park in the summer, you know, she wore shorts one day. That's something she would never be able to do um, ever. But we all had to kind of dress down to be in 100 degree weather in the park. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time, um, but again, we will develop a FAQ following the conference and send it out to everybody who participated so that everybody's questions are addressed. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Stacy Phillips, the uh, Victim Justice Program Specialist with OVC, to provide some closing remarks. Hi, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> back on. Wow, I don't even know where to start right now. I just want to say, Julie, and, and I think you said, uh, Jerice, you may be my spirit people. Um, I love everything that you just said. I've been, I'm just in all right now, honestly. So um, I, I was actually, I just have to say this. So I worked in DC at Bridgeport for 12 years, right out of college. And I remember people looking at me sideways because I dressed down all the time. And that was my way of building rapport with my clients. And so many people would be like suits and looking nice and this and that and nothing. I didn't look nice, but you know, I was the girl in the jeans and you know, I'm not here in a hierarchy. Let's like work together. Let's figure this out. So I, I think you guys are my spirit people. Um, so I'm so sad uh, to say that we've come to the end of this grant team meeting. I have loved every part of, of the last two days so much of what was presented um, resonated with me, I'm sure with you as well. Um, so if we were in person, I would ask everybody to start yelling out, like, what was your favorite thing that you learned? And so for just a minute, appease me. And I would love to hear from you, put in the chat, um, your favorite part, your favorite presentation, or something you learned over the last two days that you're gonna take back with you. Um, I'll start, for me, um, gosh, it's, it was real, it's really hard to define, to be honest with you, but I'm going to go with the family engagement uh, piece and the cafe intervention with the entire family. You know, the understanding of, of family engagement um, and family preservation is just so important um, for our families and to help mitigate that trauma, building connection, you know, understanding those relationships. Like I said, just a second ago, I spent 12 years um, in direct service at DCF in Bridgeport, Connecticut, back in the late 90s, aging myself. Um, but no one, we didn't understand at that point what, what family preservation was and why it was so important to, you know, keep that visitation going. If, if somebody didn't see their kid for like two or three weeks, there was kind of this like, well, well, we just don't have time. And, you know, I absolutely love the discussion about uh, CBT maybe not working for, for families and the need for those non-traditional therapies, because that's right. You cannot do CBT on a person with a dysregulated stress response system. It's literally just not possible. So when you see your clients not moving forward and changing the needle, if you're doing CBT, it's because they have a dysregulated stress response system and they're not able to, to talk because their brocus region has been impacted by the trauma that they've been going through. So let me see some of the others that you guys have said. Oh my God, there's only like two of you responding. Somebody had to like take away something else. So yes, the science and power of hope. Awesome. Mindful spirit. I want this book. Yeah, absolutely. The mindfulness camps. Those were really cool. So, you know, I wish I could take credit for the design of this initiative because who knew that it would turn into something so transformational, but I do need to give a big shout out to my colleague and friend, Bethany Case, who played a direct role in the design of this initiative back in 2018 and in its implementation for a couple of years. So she is the person who worked hard on the design, the ongoing collaboration with other federal agencies, and really voiced the importance of cross-sector collaboration and partnerships with the sites. You know, we both worked in child protection services for years with direct service, and we knew early on about the disconnect and the silos that continued to prohibit families from, you know, uh, from reaching the ability to get better. Um, but it is because of the work that all of you have continued to do um, in your communities that is really shifting the paradigm and the stigma of drug addiction. After the last two days, I can definitely say 100% that all of you truly understand 
what it is going to take to help a person heal. And you truly comprehend that since the entire family is impacted, especially the children that are impacted by this wicked problem, that we have to work with the entire family and their surroundings in their community to help them feel safe and to help them get better. So when I speak to my grantees and, my, and the TA providers, I always tell them, you know, I was you, I was a grantee, I get it, I know what it's like to be in the trenches, but you keep doing that work, you keep moving forward throughout all of the rigmarole of society, the politics, the, the barriers, and you continue to do the work because you know that the families and the communities need it. I tell them, I don't want you to think outside the box. I literally want you to throw the entire box away. And what we've learned is that families and substance dependent individuals um, needed back in the day, what they needed, what they were getting back in the day wasn't right. We are now in a place because of individuals and agencies like yourselves that keep on pressing and, and getting through the barriers and recognizing that to move the needle forward, we really do have to implement these new innovative ideas to transform lives and to change the system. And you guys are doing that. So after the two days, I know that all of you are doing this work each and every day. You've learned from the past. You have made necessary changes and interventions. You've become incredible, innovative ways to change lives. And we know that it's not easy. And we here at OBC, we applaud all of you. We applaud all of you and your work. We appreciate all of you. We are grateful for all you have done and accomplished and for what your continued efforts to fight the good fight by continuing to break through those barriers. And we are so grateful for you. JBS International and staff, you put together and implemented an amazing grantee meeting and you should all be so proud of yourselves for what you have put together and brought to just on this webinar, how many seven, 77 people, 100 people all over the country. Um, I guarantee you that people are gonna be talking about the last two days for a very, very long time, especially the lessons learned. So from myself um, and those of us at OBC, a huge thank you. I hope that all of you um, take back at least one thing that you learn, take it back to your agency, share it with your agency, your knowledge, your leadership, maybe choose to implement something that you learn, add to your services, because that is how change starts. Um, I also hope that hearing all of the amazing work that has been done over the, and continues to be done over the last two days has increased your levels of hope. Uh, because we know from the research of Dr. Chan Hellman that hope begets hope. So on behalf of, I'm going to say JBS and OBC and all of our grant managers and myself, I wish you a great rest of your week and an amazing weekend and then back to the grind on Monday. So we won't say goodbye. We'll just say until next time. And hopefully we will be in person when that happens. So thank you.